Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. As always, a huge shout out to the team, Mitch, Bill, and Sean. I love you guys. And to our special advisory committee that can be found at www.scbrtalk.com forward slash advisory committee. Click on the link and learn about the remarkable leaders doing the work. Speaking of remarkable leaders, I am absolutely honored to introduce Lupe Valdez, Director of Public Affairs at Union Pacific Railroad, who joined the Union Pacific Railroad as the Director of Public Affairs in July of 2005. She served the Los Angeles Basin, including Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Riverside, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and Imperial Counties. Her responsibilities include working with local elected officials and community groups in Southern California. Lupe attended the University of Southern California, where she earned both her bachelor's and master's degree in public administration. Lupe actively participates as a valued member of the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership, is now the Senior Director of Public Affairs for the Union Pacific Railroad, and currently holds the title of Chairwoman for the Inland Empire Economic Partnership. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lupe. Yes, thank you for having me. It's great to be here today. Beautiful. So as you know, my first question to each of my guests is to please give us a rundown, you know, a brief history and time, your journey to becoming the Director of Public Affairs for Union Pacific Railroads. Well, if you would have told me as a young child that I would work for a railroad company, I probably would not have even understood that at all. Um, my journey actually began uh, in growing up in Northeast LA. I'm a, I'm a native Angelino. Um, and it was, um, I, I focused a lot in local schools, working with my local community, uh, even when I was in high school and, in, and through college. Um, but I think one of the things was for me personally, I ended up getting into the field first of a nonprofit, working uh, with a local nonprofit organization in Los Angeles. But then I stepped into working in public transit. And in our household, my father was the only one that drove. My mother did not drive. So at that point, at that time in LA, it was called the Rapid Transit District, uh, the Southern California Rapid Transit District, the RTD. And I was actually offered a position to be a community affairs representative for the RTD. And part of me felt um, it was a special thing because my mother had depended and I rode the bus with my mother everywhere in Los Angeles. So it was really kind of fascinating for me to to want to be part of that organization. So that's what got me into transit in the first place. And I did public transit for the next uh, 15 years in, uh, in Los Angeles. I ended up creating the merged organization today known as Metro. And then, uh, and then I did a little stint in a, a place called the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So I learned a lot about air quality issues in Southern California, about regulatory um, uh, you know, impacts to businesses. And I worked a lot with folks in Southern California with regard to rules and regulations. So um, then I went back into transportation, uh, an organization by the name of Metrolink, Southern California Regional Rail Authority that many of you know or see. I was hired by them to also work government affairs for them and local community relations. And that's really where I learned my railroad. It's kind of interesting, but commuter rail and, and uh, freight rail have the same basic uh, pieces in terms of what makes it go. And so um, a lot of the engineers that were working for at that moment for Metrolink were former Southern Pacific employees. So they taught me everything I wanted to know. They offered me just, I needed to understand switches and locomotives and what does that mean and a siding and, you know, it just, they explained to me the nomenclature, but I got to see it firsthand. And uh, a few years later, then uh, UP came knocking at my door 
asking if I wanted to be the first, I am the first public affairs director for Union Pacific Railroad. At that moment, they did not have public affairs staff. And so I was the first one hired in this new role um, from, um, for UP. So uh, here I, I've been 19 years in this role and kind of expanded my territory to also include Arizona and Southern Nevada. So it's that, been a fascinating journey on that, on that front. <laughs> absolutely. That is absolutely phenomenal. And so how does it feel to know that you, that, you know, you are, have stepped into a completely new role in what many would perceive to be a male dominated field, right? Because it's right. Uh, railroad systems. It's, it's railroad. Yes. yes. And, and, and railroads, like many of the other male dominated industries that I've been in was, um, was uh, it was a very difficult job to have you are a woman or a, or a mom. And so um, it, to me, it's one of those things where um, because I was the only woman, maybe the only, for the most part, the only Latina involved in these areas, that was something that was very, um, that also offered me a great opportunity to learn a lot and to learn more than I needed to learn to make sure that, um, I could understand every aspect of the business as much as I could and understand using that information and sharing that with the public, with elected officials or with whoever I needed to, you know, share that with. Absolutely. So speaking of one of the pressing concerns currently live today for the past few days now um, are the various fires that are occurring right now. We oh. are in San Bernardino County. The line fire is of the greatest importance at the moment. I think we mentioned uh, reports uh, showed that there were maybe 3% contained, um, okay. but uh, threatening 65,000 homes. Uh, please talk about that and how it impacts the rail system and sure. how it is that you navigate those challenges as they develop. Right, currently um, the fire is not impacting any of our lines. However, we have had fires impact our lines in two ways. We also have what's called fire trucks that we can put on the railroad, on the actual tracks themselves that can help local fire departments with additional resources in areas where they can't access. So there's many times in areas where you don't have a local road right next to the fire. So we can take our special water trucks and get them into the fire and folks are trained to be able to um, uh, help firefighters. Uh, we've also had a situation where a few years ago um, in Santa Barbara County, we had to shut down our line only because the fire department needed to put uh, hoses over our track to be able to put out fires uh, once it had crossed um, the 101 freeway and we're right next to the 101 freeway up in Santa Barbara. So it depends on the situation. We work a lot with fire life and safety and we have a coordinated response if they need us, uh, whether it's additional foam for a fire, let's say not as massive as what we're dealing with today, but if it's a, a, a business or a company that needs additional uh, fire retardant, we are available to do that. We're also available with our fire trucks, but it's something that we're continuously, um, uh, you know, we understand because we have dry vegetation and there are a number of areas that have uh, obviously this fire danger when you have less and less water and this year is one going to be one of those years and our heat, the temperatures that we have gone through are similar to those in Arizona, um, not, not normally indicative of Southern California but I mean, that's, that's added to it as well. So we also train our staff in terms of hydration, making sure they're safe, making sure they don't cross lines if, if something is unsafe. So we are in constant communication with all of our conductors and engineers that are on these trains, just in case it does come into contact with our rail lines um, and we protect in place. So we move them to a safe location if that is the case. Right. And so currently, give us a brief overview of where Union Pacific Railroad lines are established, because my understanding is it's obviously it's national. But please talk right. about how far and wide, uh, you know, if you have the number of miles of tracks that you yeah. guys have and locomotives and so forth. Sure. We serve 23 states. We're mostly west of the Mississippi. And if you talk about miles, we're about 32,700 miles of track. 
So I have a lot of a ribbon of track that runs in over 22,000 communities um, across these 23 states. So we are a live network. We're in a unique situation where um, the rail industry is um, unique in that while we compete with each other, let's say in California, there's another class, we're called class one railroads that travel across the country. Um, we are also have uh, the responsibility to serve the East Coast, even though I don't have tracks in the East Coast. So we have agreements with our competitors to ensure that people get products and that they can go across country. We're a big uh, mover of military. Um, so uh, we also will move in, in terms of any type of nat uh, you know, uh, a national disaster or natural disaster, both. Uh, we have uh, moved, uh, we did it for when I first started for Katrina uh, into Louisiana and we worked um, effortlessly to try to get things back to normal after Katrina. So we always look at, we're always part of that fabric, no matter where we're at. We all work together to ensure that people can get goods and services, especially if they're impacted by any kind of uh, disaster of that sort. So um, we we just have, we serve a lot of communities. We are, uh, and again, for Southern California, that's how many of the communities grew up. The rail came first, and then the communities and the towns, uh, you know, uh, basically developed around stations because that's where they could either get their products or passenger service to be able to go to another town or somewhere. So a lot of Southern California was settled by where the railroad was and where the stations were along the way. That is remarkable. I love that historic part of Union Pacific Railroads because it is such an iconic uh, part of the fabric of our country and our communities. As you mentioned, um, the community sprouted up along these depots to, you know, have access to their goods, to their wares, and then also, okay. of course, transportation. So um, absolutely inspiring. And I'm sure uh, all of those people in the 22,000 communities are waiting to hear. And if they have a line passing through their community, uh, want to know, about the quiet zones and what is sure. that? What that's about and how you determine uh, when and how to right. notify um, right. other uh, uh, transportation right. uh, users of their sure impending one of the, <laughs> appearance. Right. One of the most misunderstood things is why do engineers sound their horns right. um, in the middle of the night in particular? <laughs> that's the question I get all the time. And engineers or conductors who are running our trains, and that's commuter rail, uh, freight rail, it doesn't, either one um, is re are required by law, both state and federal law, to sound their horns before they enter into a crossing, which is where the street and the tracks intersect. That is a law. So they can get a ticket, a fine for not sounding their horn, which I know communities don't like, especially in the wee hours of the morning or late at night, but that is required by law. Back in 2005, the federal government um, approved a program for communities to be able to have quiet zones, but they had to create a safety environment around that intersection so that it was as safe as if the engineer was blowing the horn. Mm -hmm. That was something brand new. Uh, it had never been tried before. It's now been around 19 years. And we have several communities that have done quiet zones. They do, the cities or counties uh, do pay for all the improvements because it's something that they want for the community versus something for the rail. And um, those projects are, um, uh, again, they take away probably about 85 to 90 percent of the horn sounding because the engineer will still be able to blow the, the horn if there's a maintenance project or if there's people on the tracks. Mm. And those are the two conditions for the most part where they will sound the horn and we let people know that during those at times, they have to sound the horn for safety reasons in terms of ensuring the people are safe that are working on the railroad track, you know, that our maintenance workers or contractors are safe. But it does take away the required horn blowing and it is allowed by federal law to have quiet zones um, if cities, and cities have to go through a process, they apply, um, they, we work with, in California, we work with the Public Utilities Commission who has regulatory authority over crossings in California. So we work with them to analyze the crossing and make sure 
that there are things in place where anyone who's not familiar knows that the train does not blow its horn at that crossing. So please talk about what those safety mitigation measures are that sure. allow those quiet zones to exist. Sure, there could be a combination of them. It depends on the street. Not all of them are the same. So let's say I have a four lane highway. We may have to in, include uh, medians that are in the middle so people can't go around the gate arms to try to avoid the when, when the trains go down, when the arms go down. We might have an extended arm where the arm goes all the way across the four lanes or two lanes of traffic. Uh, we Signage. Signage is a big deal to let people know, okay, at this intersection, the trains do not sound Please, you know, and, and we warn them and it could be with lights um, separate than the lights that currently exist at many of the crossings here in Southern California. There are places where we can put uh, advanced warning signs and letting people know the train does not blow the horn at this intersection. Please proceed with caution. So there's those kinds of things that can that cities can do to ensure that people and the riding public are safe when they're crossing that intersection if there is a quiet zone. Um, so there's there's a number of things uh, on that front where cities will have will be responsible. But we all talk about this beforehand. It's not a surprise to a city. We all have to come to an agreement on what the safety precautions are. And it obviously has to be approved by the Public Utilities Commission in California. Right. And so um, I'm sure prior to that, you received lots of noise complaints, right? Yes. And among probably many other complaints, uh, what would you say are some of your most pressing complaints and pressing focus today? I think in Southern California, our pressing complaints come one from homelessness. And unfortunately, I have a ribbon of land that's wide open. My land is not, I can't close off the property, even though it's private property in California. And this happens also with Metrolink, because we work a lot with Metrolink on um, trying to ensure that trespassers are not on, on the rights of way. It's not a safe place for them to be. Mm -hmm. um, but the homeless issue has really been a challenge in, in Southern California and all of California. I have that challenge, but I'm more familiar with Southern California. But I think the other part that really has changed this, and people used to call them, and this is probably not a politically correct term, but people use the term hobos or they used to use other terminology. Um, it is not what we're faced with today. Today is a whole different ballgame. And I think the challenge is that the laws in California have diminished with regard to um, citations for misdemeanor. If you are on caught on my property, private, any private property, mm -hmm. it's a misdemeanor citation. And many times, unfortunately, in California, and I realize we have a lot of other um, activity and other crimes that take place, but they tend to be dismissed, which really doesn't help us try to tell people that that's not where they should be. They think, oh, it's no big deal. I can go back to that location. I can put up a tent there. We do not want these individuals on our right of way. It is not a safe place. California has one of the highest rates of fatalities, pedestrian fatalities in California. Uh, then um, I think my only other state that compares to us is Texas. Uh, again, um, the fatalities are uh, very frequent and unfortunate. We don't want to have fatalities. Our engineers can't close their eyes, they have to go, go through this and they sometimes also may need counseling after an incident. Uh, so it could be traumatic on all fronts for the community, for the engineer, uh, obviously for the family of the individual. I mean, you, you could look at that. And those are the things that I think our laws have to be strengthened to really be impactful when people are doing something, especially that could present you know, they could turn out to be a fatality. Um, and again, sometimes folks, um, you know, we have a, a, a fair amount of folks that are much younger than they used to be in terms of the homeless. Um, but we work, we have actually a nonprofit that we have hired to do community outreach. And I call it street outreach to talk to these individuals and connect them with services within the community. So we're not we're not telling them they have to go two miles, you know, 10 miles away. We're talking, we're looking, we try our, our nonprofit works with whoever the local providers are in the area, whether they need to go to a hospital, 
whether they're open to interim housing, whether they are um, have a family member that will accept them. We don't just give them a bus ticket. We make sure that there's a family member that's going to receive them if it's out of state or if it's in another place outside of Southern California. But unfortunately, you can't force people to take service. And that's our challenge. I think from my perspective, I can't force them to take service if they don't want to. They can walk away, uh, even though they're illegally trespassing on our property. So it's a challenge. Um, and so I think until the judicial piece gets worked on, and I know the governor has passed the, the court system to be able to help folks that cannot make decisions for themselves, that's, that's gonna be a huge help. I think just tr tightening some of our laws so that we can return to the place where there's consequences for your actions, and it it it, me it has to mean something. It can't just be, a, a, you know, a, it just can't be a, a site that's not that doesn't have any teeth, because right. then they'll come right back. That and that's our challenge. Is I can clean up one day and they'll be back by the evening hours, and again, right. it's not a safe place for them to be. Bottom line, it's not safe for them. Um, and communities uh, will call me to complain about that. So that's one of my big complaints. I think the other thing, because we had a rainy season this year, it's been vegetation. I mean, we're having vegetation where we never had vegetation before because we had <laughs> we had rain. I mean, we had tons of rain everywhere. So the desert, I mean, you know, normally the desert is not where I have, and I've gotten tons of vegetation issues. There are things that are growing uh, all over the place. And now obviously the dry season comes. And so, and we don't have snow. So in other places, they have snow that kills off some of this stuff. Uh, we don't have that here. So we have a 12 month growing season, you know, whether it's tumbleweeds or green plants, uh, I think vegetation is another huge issue because obviously fires, danger, et cetera. And we understand that concern. So um, we also have to manage that with regard to how we approach our vegetation issues. So I think those are, I mean, I think those are some of the challenges. And obviously I think we've also had now seen a lot of cargo theft issues, mm -hmm. big challenge in cargo theft. Um, and it, the laws are finally changing. They did not really have a good punitive method for people caught stealing from trains. It's not like the U.S. mail where it's a federal offense. Mm -hmm. um, and so some counties weren't prosecuting. And I had situations where people were arrested multiple times and never prosecuted. So again, We've come to a place where we need to go more toward center from my perspective of, I realize you wanna help people. However, I think they have to have consequences for breaking the law. That's the bottom line for me. And I, I, I really believe that until we gotta to get to that point where you have to be accountable for your actions. Absolutely. And when you speak about the homeless population that are setting up camps around, uh, you know, the easements, they're the right of ways right. around the tracks, that's uh, devastating and very, very dangerous, like you said. And it's sad to know that, you know, taxpayers have paid billions and billions of dollars right. into programs to serve the community, give them resources and allow right. them the opportunity to uh, transform and right. reintegrate into society through housing right. options, uh, you know, counseling and various other mechanisms. And right. it's um, probably like you said, it's going to take a conservatorship uh, effort and right. policy to start taking that decision out of their hands and start implementing some type of governance to say you right. will go into this rehabilitation center, you will become right. uh, again, a renewed and contributing member of society and not right. uh, languish on the side of railroad tracks. Tracks, right. Correct. I mean, that's Correct. not that's not humane for anybody to Correct. be living alongside railroad tracks within feet of fatality. Right. Um, Correct. And it, it's it's a huge challenge. I, and I, can only imagine. And I think the one thing I want to add is we have to have specialized contractors to do these cleanups. This is not these are contractors that we hire. Um, but that are very specialized in being able to clear these areas. And, and it's the case with all the cities in Southern California that do this, all of the local jurisdictions or counties. Uh, we have hazmat that is out there and we have we just can't hire. I mean, when I first started the railroad, there was times when I can actually, not all over Southern California, but there were times when I could shut down a portion of the railroad and I could have communities come out and pick up trash and I'd give them gloves and trash bags and we'd make kind of a, a cleanup day. 
that is no longer possible because of the situation that we're encountering now, which is, um, you know, which would not be safe for any community right. volunteer to do. Although people continue to offer me, we'll go out there and clean. I'm like, no, no, no. We have it's specialized contractors. It's, it is just yes. not safe, not safe anymore because it's not just trash. It is, it could, be, it could be other things. Absolutely. And that is perfect timing. We're coming up on a break. Thank you so much, Lupe. Stick around. Everybody listening, Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk Southern California Business Report here today with a trailblazer in the world of public affairs. Lupe Valdez serves as the Director of Public Affairs at Union Pacific Railroad. She has been instrumental in shaping communities across the Los Angeles Basin, tirelessly working with local officials and community groups to drive positive change. With a wealth of knowledge and experience, Lupe brings a unique perspective shaped by her education at the University of Southern California, where she earned both her bachelor's and master's degree in public administration when we return. Hi, I'm Dana Rademacher with MGR Property Management. A lot of people wonder about the value that property management has for their property. Property management can include all property types, including residential, commercial, and HOA. It is valuable because property managers are experienced in what can happen at your property. We're aware of liabilities. We're able to do predictive and preventative maintenance. We know what is coming up with the changes in the weather, the seasons, how old certain aspects or different capital projects at your property are. We're able to best negotiate contract pricing, legalities with your tenants and anything else that you may need to ensure that you're getting the full value of the property. If you're interested in speaking with the representative at MGR Property Management regarding your property management needs, you can visit our website at mgrrealestate.com or you can call our number at area code 909-581-6600 to be connected with the representative. We are the Empire Strikers the professional sports team of the Inland Empire. We are a fast action and community inspired pro indoor soccer team. Our mission is to inspire the Empire. Home games, community events, watch parties, and youth camps are all back. Professional indoor soccer is back. Join us and come watch the greatest show on turf at Toyota Arena or on Twitch. Visit www.TheEmpireStrikers.com for more and any information. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit Sheriff'sJobs.com. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only School of Entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful Entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. Welcome back, everyone. Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report, here today with a trailblazer in the world of public affairs, Lupe Valdez, who serves as the Director of Public Affairs at Union Pacific Railroad. She has been instrumental in shaping communities across the Los Angeles basin, tirelessly working with local officials and community groups to drive positive change. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lupe. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. 
Perfect. So prior to the break, we were discussing some of the more frequent uh, challenges that you have alongside uh, your right of ways for the railroad, for Union Pacific Railroad. And one of those boils down to the homeless issue and the sure. lack of accountability that exists for encampments or those that choose to set up in a very, very dangerous place um, around uh, the railway system. Correct. And we, we, uh, Safety is one of our key elements for our company. Obviously, now being a 162-year-old company, um, safety is one of those things that that is on the top of our list with regard to how we operate. And obviously, this social issue has impacted a number of us across the board. Um, and so it, it is going to take, to me, some very different approaches to deal with a population that may be difficult to serve and may have a myriad of issues. So it's not one size fits all, communities are different. And so our approaches have to be flexible enough to allow for um, outreach, but also to allow for individuals um, to choose paths um, to have a safer situation that happens in all of our communities. Absolutely. Um, and so with that said, Lupe, please talk about the larger view of the logistical segment for Union sure. Pacific Railroads. Sure. We are um, proud to be in California. Uh, we have a lot of railroad track in Southern California. Uh, for those of you that may not know, back in 1996, actually, Union Pacific merged which, with Southern Pacific Railroad, which was a California-based corporation out of the Bay Area. Um, so that really created a bigger footprint for Union Pacific here in California in, in 96, uh, 1996. Um, but one of the things that we've also seen a difference is intermodal transport. I mean, when you used to see the railroad tracks, you used to see them carrying lumber or carrying vehicles, but intermodal um, and our whole reliance on a worldwide economic system, uh, whether it was goods from China or goods from other places, really changed the world in terms of, and also how things became put in containers. I mean, you didn't have that before. So you have shipping containers. And so not, and not every container comes from China. I want to make sure people understand it's not all international cargo. So I may have what's called 20 foot or 40 foot containers, those can go on cargo ships. When you see those longer containers that are 52 feet, those are nine times out of 10 domestic. They are not containers that come on a ship, but they are containers that uh, after containers are uh, unpackaged and things are separated and go to different locations, trucking companies can take these containers and go to different sites to be able to deliver the goods to the, the last mile, as we have called it. So intermodal is definitely a, a big issue for us. We have uh, introduced in um, San Bernardino County, we've introduced intermodal service, which we did not have uh, before uh, 2021. We introduced it in 2021, and it is at our Colton, our West Colton facility. So we do both manifest, which means it doesn't involve a truck, and then we do intermodal which does involve a truck. And so a truck will drop off a container or uh, you know, take a container. Now, if you think of the logistics industry in San Bernardino, you've had a huge amount of warehousing that's taken place over a number of years. And for UP customers, they would have to get on the freeway you know, in San Bernardino, normally the 10 freeway and go west to the city of industry. That was my closest site where they could drop off or pick up a container. Now they're able to do that in Colton. It's really where between, five, I cover four cities. I, uh, my, my yard looks like a banana shape. So I, the, my, my um, westernmost terminus is Fontana and my easternmost terminus is Colton, the Bloomington Colton community. So um, in that we'll be able to serve those businesses that really just wanna take a shorter trip to drop off a container or pick up a container. Um, and so it's it's changed a lot of our modeling, uh, even though we're still busy with uh, traffic that comes in from the ports, we really felt that this was a need to be able to serve San Bernardino and the Ellen Empire 
with this type of service there. Um, a lot of it moves, you know, you see it all the time. There's just a lot of activity. And um, while it can be challenging, we also support local communities in trying to improve infrastructure on the interstates or on the streets and roads. And we also, you know, do support local jurisdictions with regard to that goods movement portion. Absolutely. So speaking of the goods movement portion, let's talk about the impact, uh, you know, related yeah. to the distribution of all of those goods right. that you're moving on the Union Pacific lines and how that right. breaks out when you talk right. about, you know, things that come off the port versus things that are coming through the border from Mexico right. um, and how that economic pie breaks out. Right. And it's fascinating to me because uh, while I covered Southern California for all the time that I've been at UP for 19 years, um, covering also Arizona, we have a total six ports of entry with Mexico in, between Texas, Arizona and California. And especially in California, people may not understand the economic benefit of having those ports of entry with regard to not only creating jobs, uh, but creating economic value. Mexico is our biggest trading partner. Um, and it is also Arizona's biggest trading partner, not just Cal in, in California, but in Arizona. And so what you see many times is a lot of benefit coming from uh, goods that are traded, et cetera, between Mexico and the United States. We also have uh, a port of entry with Canada as well. Um, and so, uh, but, uh, but for the southern portion of the southwest, we do a lot of work with Mexico and uh, we are looking forward to working with the new administration that comes in in a few weeks, the first female president of Mexico. And we, we actually have a team of people that are stationed in Mexico City that work for UP, but work on everything international with Mexico, with the country. So it's kind of a unique situation. Um, and we share a lot of challenges, but we also share a lot of benefit from the jobs. I think it's fascinating, Yvette, to me to see that there are people that may decide to live in a community. It's different in San Diego than it is in Nogales, Arizona, where some people may decide to live in Mexico, but work in the United States, are citizens of the US. Um, and so there is a lot of folks or people that come from Mexico that want to shop in Tucson, if they want to go to the outlet malls, they want to go to activities that we have on the US side. There's a lot more of that that happens at these border towns, which really improves our economics for the United States. So it's not just the trading partners, it's also the part that the, the individuals that want to come here to whether it's to go to recreation or whether it's to shop. So there's a lot of activity that happens cross border that normally doesn't, isn't well known and isn't um, uh, talked about a lot. I mean, everyone talks border and assumes the immigration piece, <clears throat> but they don't see the economic benefit piece, which I think is in billions of dollars, by the way, in terms of the, uh, I was looking up at the records for, um, for Southern California in terms of uh, economic uh, development for Arizona, it was $178 billion for Arizona. And for us here, it was closer to, we had like a huge number, like over 200 million. And I got these stats, by the way, from the California State Chamber. This was not UP stats. We don't, but I wanted to see what was the economic benefit. And there's huge economic benefit as well as jobs. Uh, a lot of cross-border jobs that, that take place as well. So we are benefiting it on both fronts, not just on the economic front, but also on the job creation front with companies that may station themselves on both sides of the border and have have activities in Mexico, but also in the United States. So it's, it's fascinating, uh, but there's a lot of positive things that happen um, with our border cities that don't get publicized a lot or enough as far as I'm concerned. Right. So please talk about some of the regional organizations you work with that assist you in moving some of your um, ideas forward and your, uh, you know, objectives forward and having a broader view of what the needs and demands are for the communities, including um, Inland Empire Economic Partnership and Inland Action. 
Right. I think one of the important things that I knew coming into this job was we needed to establish a footprint in the sense of community outreach. I had always done community outreach for public agencies, not necessarily for private sector, but I knew that there was a role for us to play. Um, Inland Empire Economic Partnership provided a, a benefit role because it is not just focused on one issue, but across the board. And the organization really focuses on how to improve the livelihood and the lives of people in the Inland Empire. Bottom line, I don't care if it's education, if it's logistics, if it's in the medical profession, if it's, you know, whatever it is, how do we improve? We're all wanting to improve the quality of life for folks in San Bernardino and Riverside County. And IEP was focused in that mission. And I felt that was such a strong mission uh, because it covered both counties and I cover both counties. Um, Inland Action has been very focused on policy matters impacting um, San Bernardino. And I think one of the things that's important is that they have also established a policy driven agenda to again, support um, not just business, but all folks in the San Bernardino area. And so they've taken different stances, whether it be on um, getting an, another uh, judicial uh, building built, uh, getting more judges um, to be in the Inland Empire. Not You don't have to go to LA, I mean, because that is hard for people. Uh, but they push the same on getting more uh, local uh, TSA agents at airports in Ontario or now San Bernardino that's become a big hub, will be a big hub for Amazon Air. So you know, again, we have a huge population out here. Folks should not have to travel, you know, from LA to, to work at Ontario Airport. There should be local folks in those jobs in the Inland Empire. So they look at all these aspects of how to improve things. And I think both organizations do an incredible job on pushing economic development, but also for the benefit of all, not just um, not just some, but also looking at all those. So if it's medical professionals, um, San Antonio Hospital, Kaiser, whatever, you know, UCR, whatever that, you know, getting a medical school there. I mean, you have all these things that are available in the Inland Empire and just people don't know enough about us to know what we have. And so I think that that's the benefit of these organizations that do this work across the board. Absolutely. And I love that leadership such as yourself, that it's dynamic, innovative, visionary, can come together, pull those resources, leverage them for the benefit of the community and, you know, create a, a better future for, for everyone. And like you said, um, and it's unfortunate, but the Inland Empire has seen its fair share of disparities. You know, you're talking about right. the judicial system, uh, the shortage of courts, shortage of judges. Um, it's it's a true impact, but it's because of leadership such as yourself and others that, you know, work towards towards moving the needle towards positive right. change for the community, that makes all the difference. So thank you so much for all of your work and your dedication to those uh, efforts and that mission. Um, so with that said, let's talk about um, some of the green regulations and strategies that you're implementing to meet new requirements. Sure. And I think California, while they are uh, definitely focused on zero emissions, and that's an important goal, um, the the challenge in our industry is we're a lot more complicated. I mean, I have a hybrid car, right. but that is a car that I bought here in California. Uh, it doesn't, I don't travel to, you know, Mississippi or San Antonio, Texas on that with that vehicle. So the challenge with our network is we're in 23 states. We have to find fuels that work for us. And I realize we still, we still operate on low sulfur low sulfur diesel in California. Um, and we're even testing biofuels. But what you have to know is in our industry with our locomotives, and I'm going to focus on the locomotive because that's the power. Uh, those locomotives have to be able to operate in boiling temperature like we've had the last week here in Southern California, or freezing temperature like I have, you know, up in Truckee and up in the Lake Tahoe area where I have tracks. Um, so we can't have a fuel that doesn't operate in those extreme ranges of weather conditions. And we also have to have a fuel that's available. Uh, a lot is being discussed in California about the hydrogen um, 
uh, funds that are coming into California. And that can, that definitely has aspects of it that may or may not work with railroads, but you need to study these and you need to double check that they don't create a problem for you on the safety side. We have tested what used to be called green goats. I had them actually in Riverside at our auto facility there in what used to, what's Harupa Valley. And green goats were electric uh, locomotives. They did not go across country. They basically pushed uh, cars within the yard and it was lighter duty because there were vehicles. So it wasn't like heavy duty uh, containers. Uh, the challenge was that we operate 24 seven. So I needed two locomotives because basically I'm charging one while I'm working the other one. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to use one locomotive, I needed two and we were willing to test it. But the batteries for these types of locomotives were like three feet by seven feet, huge batteries. Now, let's think about sustainability. Um, what happens at the end of their useful life? That's a big piece to put in a landfill if I can't reuse it or if I can't rehabilitate it in some way. We even tried truck engines. Truck engines are um, much more advanced than locomotive engines are. Normally, the way it works, it starts in our cars then it works toward light and uh, medium duty vehicles. Then you go to trucks. And then probably 20 years later, you get to locomotives because that's just the way the world has worked. And I think, um, so when we look at um, technology, that's normally the way it has worked. For us, it also has to be safe. I am a common carrier, which means my obligation by the federal government is that I carry hazardous materials. I can't refuse them. If they are packaged correctly, come from a supplier that does everything by the book, I am supposed to move that material. You do not want to have an experimental locomotive when you're moving hazmat. You just okay. don't. So, some of the hazmat I cover, by the way, is stuff that goes into making beer. Because of the quantity I cover, it's considered hazardous. It's not when you drink it, but it is when I, you know, put it in, in the mix. Um, but but people don't always understand that part. And I think it's important. We will have technology that's going to be eventually better than what we have today. I am convinced of that. There are smart minds around this world that are going to look at different options and opportunities. I just, my concern is that we need to make sure it's safe and that it works. I do no one any good if my tr my mile long train stops in the middle of a city and can't move. I, that That is not what I want. I want it to move out of Dodge. I want it to keep continue moving, but I need the fuel source to be reliable. Right. So I am hoping, I'm hoping that California moves hopefully in a direction that allows all businesses to determine what is the best use of the fuel for them as long as it reduces emissions. And I think that's the thing. Um, there's a lot of rules in California right now. We have cargo handling rules that we abide by from the state that are also moving in that direction. We also have to make sure there's enough energy. Whatever that source is, there has to be enough of it. So while, while the state seems to have focused on electric, um, that's to me, that should be part of the portfolio, but not the whole portfolio, because we all know we have to generate the electricity before we transmit it to where it needs to go. And it, that takes time to do. So my hope is that we can get to a point where we look at a portfolio of fuels that reduce emissions uh, and get us closer to our goal of zero, but allow us to continue to operate economically and in 22 other states. Absolutely. Because like you said, you don't want to be testing uh, uh, energy sources that can become hazardous. If you have a three foot by seven foot battery hauling chemicals, you don't want this uh, to combust, uh, start a fire that lasts for days and days because a battery of that size is difficult to put out paired with, you know, the potential to ignite hazardous materials and chemicals. Right. So um, right. it'll be interesting right. to see what happens and how you're right. able to navigate that. Um, but for now, and, please talk. And about can I just mention one other thing? And certainly, you know, my mile long train, that's the equivalent of about 340 trucks. So, I mean, part of me is, okay, I'm, I'm, I am doing something beneficial because if it, the train wasn't there, then there'd be that many more trucks. Trucks are our friends, by the way. I am not mm -hmm. putting down trucks at all because they're part of the puzzle. They're the last mile. They're the piece that's important. But we have to also be realistic 
with what kinds of things we want in this system and how we're going to move forward uh, sustainably. We all want clean air. We're all working toward that, but it has to be in realistic steps. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And we're coming close to the end here, but quickly, Lupa, tell us how can the community engage, learn more, support your efforts or advocate for, uh, you know, some of the, the challenges that you're facing today? Sure. I think one of the things is there is so much information on up.com and that's our website. Uh, a lot of people can get a lot of information and this is from individuals that are just curious to know more about what we're doing in sustainability or in our business model. Um, even on there, if a business is thinking about uh, putting something on a train, wants to look at that, um, there's actually a calculator that tells them about greenhouse gas from mm -hmm. point A to point you know, Z so that they know what uh, the greenhouse gas um, you know, uh, is for that trip. Uh, it's a calculator for that reason. But there's a lot on our website and so much more. And I realize so much more has changed over our, our years where there may not be a person on the other end. But that website is loaded with information with regard to who you can contact locally, what are some of our critical issues are, and also the roles. We do a lot with local jurisdictions that uh, want to build a bridge over us or are working next to property and they want to be safe as well. Uh, or they want to, they want their utilities. We have a lot of utilities that cross us. Um, so, so that's always very, very important, you know, in terms of getting those um, applications and permits safely done for all our local jurisdictions. So a lot of pieces to that. Pie. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you are amazing. You are so talented. I'm so proud of everything that you've done. And so is everyone that's listening today. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your expertise and your vision to overcome so many of these challenges that, you know, Union Pacific and, um, you know, you and your uh, right of ways are facing today. So right. thank you so much for your time and educating us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful time. And again, I look forward to future meetings. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. We're, we'll have you on again for future updates. All right. Everybody that's listening today, don't forget to find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on scbrtalk.com. Don't miss my interview with Susan Harrington, the president of Communities Lifting Communities. Susan joined the Hospital Association of Southern California as the executive director for Communities Lifting Communities in July 2018. And since February 2021 serves as a president for Communities Lifting Communities, an affiliate nonprofit organization of HASC. Uh, next week, we will have immediate past supervisor for San Bernardino County's District 5, Josie Gonzalez. She has lived in Colton for 20 years and spent the next 23 years of her life in Del Rosa area, an unincorporated pocket of San Bernardino. In 1995, uh, she went to the city of Fontana, where she served as a city of Fontana council member until her election as the fifth district supervisor in 2004. We're going to discuss the evolution of the economic landscape in San Bernardino County. You do not want to miss it. We will see you all next week. Mm -hmm.